Miss mm -hmm. Leslie Shore from UConn. Hey go. everyone. Hello. So my name is Leslie Shore. Uh, I met your fearless president, Kayla, <laughs> at a panel discussion a few weeks ago with the president of the university and some other folks, uh, various professors in the School of Engineering and other places at UConn were talking about climate change. Um, so let me just get to know you before I teach you more about me and about what I'm here to talk about today. So just with show of hands, how many of you are seniors? Juniors? Okay. Sophomores? Freshmen? Okay, awesome. How many of you are thinking of focusing on environment or climate in, in college in one way or another? A few of you, okay. Um, what other majors are you thinking about doing? Just shout them out that are not climate related. What? Political science. Political science? Computer science. Oh, computer science, okay. All right, other ones? Arts and humanities. Okay. Biomedical engineering. Biomedical engineering, all right. Uh, interesting. What are you all thinking the most important issue facing your generation is today? Any thoughts on that? You're trying to keep me in the Sorry, frame. Yeah. Sorry about no, that. No, no, no. So what are the key issues that are facing your generation? Climate change. <laughs> right, right, exactly right. That, that's probably why you're here, right, is, is worried about climate change. Um, so in my view, I think that climate energy is going to be the issue 50 years from now that is going to be focusing everyone's career and life. Because if it's not for issues related to producing enough food or having enough water to drink, it'll be issues related to refugees from all around the world to trying to move to where there's food or water or get away from extreme weather events. Or, you know, people, folks mostly just care about their families, their kids, being safe, being okay. And not to be too alarmist, but I'm afraid that that there's some real issues making sure that that's going to be the case in the future. And so sometimes when I talk to students, I almost want to say, if you're not going to be majoring in something related to climate, what are you doing? <laughs> you know? And it doesn't mean it has to be a STEM major or a science, because a lot of times we come up with solutions that don't go, don't go anywhere, because there's not the political will. There's not the economic realities. There's not the the social framework to allow that new technology to get put into place. So it's got to be teachers and artists and social scientists and political scientists and computer scientists and everybody that are putting those solutions into practice or it's not going to work for anyone. So I'll tell you a little bit about myself, my own personal journey. So I'm going to have to stand over here because I have to advance through a bunch of stuff. I was actually born not too far from here in the northeastern part of the great state of New Jersey. And I went to college at the University of Virginia, currently ranked number three in men's basketball, in case you're curious. <laughs> and that's where I met my husband. Uh, we were only 19. And uh, we knew people that were like, there's this guy from New Jersey, and you guys deserve each other. And I only found out years later that they did not mean that as a compliment. <laughs> so the two of us got together, went back to New Jersey for grad school, where he and then I got our PhDs, uh, me in chemical engineering and him in economics. And then somewhere along the way, we ended up moving to Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee, because essentially, my boss got a new job while I was in grad school. We had a couple of kids. And then I went on the job market and got a job at UConn as a faculty member. Although my husband didn't get a job right away. So he was still in Tennessee, got a dog. Then he moved up there, then we got another dog. And so that's where we are now. Um, I actually did my undergrad in environmental science. I didn't want to be an engineer because it sounded boring as hell. I didn't want to sit in a cube 
with a bunch of nerds staring at a computer all day. So I was definitely not going to be an engineer. Um, but then I went on to become an engineer later on in grad school when I realized I actually am a nerd and I should embrace that. So there you go. And then I actually did a postdoc, which was more like bio, microfluidic, biomedical engineering kind of stuff. But I applied it to an environmental set of questions. And so I am sort of the intersection of these, what some people would call different fields. Now, if you're not a STEM person, you're like, blah, 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 science, 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 whatever. But to somebody in the engineering or sciences, these are like three really different areas um, of science. And one thing that I want you to take home, if there's maybe one or two things to take home from today's chat, is you've seen Venn diagrams before, I'm sure. You are the unique intersection of all of your experiences, right? And so if you are a field hockey player that plays trumpet and also loves creative writing, how many other kids, even in this huge school, are there that are those things together at once? And as you think about shaping yourself and your future career, think about how the intersection of whatever different wonderful interests and abilities you have makes your brand. And it is really a brand. And everything that you do, every internship you take, every job you take, how you present yourself online, how you talk to faculty, where you go to college, where you go to grad school, should be reinforcing that intersection of skills, abilities, attributes, interests, talents, whatever. And I think that's what's made me successful, actually, is the breadth, the fact that these are kind of different. And there's not many people that have done these three different things at the same time. <clears throat> Currently, I'm an associate dean at the University of Connecticut. It's boring. It doesn't matter much. But I'm like in administration. I'm like, I don't know, an academic vice principal or something. So I don't end up teaching that much, actually, anymore. I'm sort of on a path towards higher administration. But I do a lot of different things. And I'm helping a lot of different people do their research and advance UConn kind of in a broader way. But I also want to stress that I'm a lot of personal things too. I'm a wife, I'm a mother, I have hobbies, I have limitations, I have struggles, and this is going to be true for all of you. And so one piece of advice that I have is to find ways to be passionate about the careers that you pursue because there's not enough time in the day to do one thing, put it aside, and then do your home stuff and put that aside. I, I brought my kids to my lab, and, and I bring my research home, and it's, it's all integrated together. And especially for, for women in the sciences, there's, there's an idea that you have to be amazing at everything all at once. And I would embrace the philosophy more so that you're kind of like a decathlete. You know, there's an Olympic event called the decathlon, right? Where you're not the best sprinter, and you're not the best discus thrower, or the best long jumper, but you're the best person that can do all of those things at the same time. And so I try to be the best mom who loves dogs and likes to cook, and who writes scientific papers and advises students, and all the things I do, right? I'm trying to be the best one of those. Now, that doesn't mean that I can be the best housekeeper or the best you know, party planner, or whatever it is I'm doing. You just got to try to do the best at all of them at the same time. So this is my family, and my daughter's 17, and she's where a lot of you are now in college application hell. <laughs> so the motivation that kind of gets me moving and, and working hard is that I do research in the area of climate. and. I do education in that area, and I do development for other faculty and other students to be able to work in that area. And I feel like it's you know, probably the most important thing I could be working on. Based on my, my, my journey, I could have been working on cancer or other issues. My brother died of cystic fibrosis, so for a while I thought about being a doctor. I thought about doing other stuff with my life. But I, I personally think, and it's going to be a little, I don't know, preachy maybe, and I'm sorry for that. So the most important thing I can do is try to find ways to address climate. And in particular, 
the, the area that I focus on, and nobody knows everything about the whole climate question, it's too big, but uh, about 30% of carbon emissions come from producing food, from growing food that you eat directly, or growing food that you feed to animals, that you later eat the animals or eat the eggs, or moving all that food around, or processing that food. And so a lot of the carbon emissions are coming from the agriculture sector, and it's the only sector, unlike transportation or buildings or other sectors of the economy, where we can go from a net emission of carbon to a net sequestration of carbon. So by changing the way we do growing, by the way we use soil and land, we could sequester, store, lock up a lot more carbon than we're currently doing. And so that's an area where I feel that we could really make a huge impact. So there's a lot of different ways to look at this. There's a lot of different um, technologies that could be pursued. I'm a big fan of genetic engineering, for example. Love to have that chat. Uh, I think it's one way to really make a huge difference on pro-nuclear power. Um, I fully get the risks that are involved, but I think the alternatives are, are somewhat worse. Uh, burning coal, I think, is a lot more dangerous than nuclear power, and we're doing a lot of burning coal these days. So there's kind of an all of the above approach that we're gonna have to pursue, but even there, there's some real limitations about how much land area there is, how many people there are to feed, and how much water is available on the face of the earth. And so currently, as we passed 8 billion people and are pushing towards 9 billion people, and even more important than the number of people is the type of diets these people are eating, a more meat-intensive diet, it's gonna require a vastly increased productivity per acre uh, without all of the carbon emissions that have been the case to date. <clears throat> so, my basic research area is to try to find a way to um, envision better production of food. Farmers have to make a living. They can't go bankrupt. They can't lose their farm to the bank, right? We gotta produce enough food for people to eat. Nothing else matters if your child is starving. At the same time, we have to grow food in a way that's not as damaging to the environment. And so, given my particular brand, I focus things down to the fundamental process that's occurring at the soil grain, at the microbe, at that spatial interaction level. So I'm not thinking about acres or meters or centimeters, I'm thinking about micrometers and then trying to scale that back up again. So if you think about a handful of soil out in the back or in your greenhouse or anywhere else, inside about a gram of soil, you could have in your hand thousands of different microorganisms that are from hundreds or even thousands of different species. Some of them are just sort of senescent. They're just chilling, they're not doing anything. Some of them are actively growing and respiring. Within one handful of soil, you can have organisms that require oxygen to grow and to live, living right next door to organisms that would be killed from being exposed to any oxygen at all. And how's that even possible? So the reason that's possible is that the microstructure of soil it's got all these nooks and crannies. It's like an English muffin, right? It's got all kinds of little bumps and channels. Inside that English muffin structure, different bacteria of different types are living up against each other, and they do different things in different places. So you probably know every single cell in your body has identical genes, but they've differentiated, and they express <coughs> those genes differently. Well, how is that done? When you're just a ball of cells, the cells on the outside experience a different environment than the cells in the middle or the cells on the inside. And so they express those genes differently and some end up becoming hearts and some end up becoming skin and some end up becoming bone just because of their microenvironment. Well, if you can imagine for bacteria, they're not just in different environments, but they have completely different genes. They might share maybe only 50 or 70% of the same genes and you're 97% similar to a chimpanzee. So there's enormous genetic variability that then has enormous different functional expression differences within that tiny little region. And these organisms are living and growing and respiring. They're eating and pooping in their environment, and that's causing them to consume the available oxygen, 
and secrete waste materials, and that action is creating differences in chemical conditions. And so the second picture is trying to show a heat map, basically, of something like oxygen. Where's the highest oxygen concentration here and here? The lowest is wherever it's black. And so there's different environments that are within micrometers of each other. Within the width of a human hair is 100 micrometers. You can have 20 different bacteria living in 20 different conditions within that tiny, tiny space. And so that causes the physical, the chemical, causes this great biological diversity to happen. And then there's feedbacks. And so the action of the microbes changes the chemistry, and the action of the chemistry changes the physics. And that's actually how terrestrial ecosystems evolved. That's how you evolved, right? You've probably heard by now that you host more microbial cells in your gut than you have you cells in your whole body, and that the gut biology does, has a lot to say about your health, your mental well-being, mood, everything. And the same is true for plants. So they evolved, plants evolved, with all of this microbial structure complexity going on. And if you've seen Avatar, especially the original one, I haven't seen the new one, that whole notion that like all the trees are connected by this like little blue string of light and energy, that's actually true. This is insane. But there are fungal hyphae, you know, basically like unicellular mushrooms that live in soil that can connect kilometers across with these channels of fungal networks that go from root to root to plant to plant. When Columbus came to this land, they think that there was a forest that stretched all the way from Massachusetts to the Mississippi River, that a squirrel could run from tree to tree to tree all the way that distance. And all of those canopies were connected, and all of those roots were connected, not just tree to tree, but tree to fungi to bacteria to fungi to tree and back again. And that's the system that actually evolved. And so what we do when we take a terrestrial system and we make it into a field and we grow crops in it is we're completely changing this microenvironment that's going on right here. We're plowing it, we're aerating it, all of that organic matter is oxidizing, it's causing all this carbon, CO2, to come up into the atmosphere, which is bad from a climate standpoint. It's also taking a lot of carbon out of the soil, so it's a poorer soil. There's less nutrients. And so then what do we do? We take a bunch of nitrogen that we've cooked up in a chemical plant using a lot of energy from fossil fuels to make N2 into ammonia, and then we pour that all over the ground so that the soil is fertile enough now so that we can grow food again. So we plow it up to strip out all of the oxygen and nutrients, and then we dump them all back in again, and we make the whole thing a huge source for greenhouse gases when instead it was evolved to be a way of sequestering carbon and storing that and locking it up into the soil. So um, that's the complex system you know, that exists. What I actually do in my lab is I take the traditional ways we study bacteria. I don't believe you probably have had microbiology classes in science here, but you've probably seen a Petri dish or you've seen one on TV, right? A strep test or something like that. But this is the way we grow bacteria, typically in the lab, in the biomedical lab. Or this is a 96 well plate. This is done a lot for biotech research. These are culture flasks. You grow, you grow like uh, mammalian cells in those. This is the kind of way things are standard done. But that's not the system I was just explaining to you with the nooks and crannies and the English muffin and all that stuff, right? And so what I do in my lab is I try to build growth chambers using microfluidics, which is a tool from biomedical engineering. So we can grow bacteria in an environment more similar to the one they evolved to live in that replicates that complexity a little bit better. So we can study a system in the lab that bears more resemblance to what's actually going on in the field because our lab system is more similar. So if you compare a real microbial habitat, like in soil, you know, it have a lot of complexity, gradients, different environments living next to each other. You take a bacteria from that system 
and you stick it in a petri dish or in a multi-well plate, it would be like the same dilution factor as you in the middle of the Indian Ocean versus you here in Fairfield County, right? So it's just a completely different environment. And the organisms in that environment do completely different things. And so what I've done with my research program is we've patented the synthetic soil chip system, and we're working with companies that make agriculture biotechnology. So just like all the pharmaceutical companies that are trying to develop new drugs, we're working with all of the ag biotech companies that are trying to develop new seeds and new biologicals for agriculture that are a little bit more gentle in terms of how they work together with plants rather than just dumping a bunch of chemicals on a monoculture roundup ready type of agriculture system. And so that's actually good for the biotech companies because a lot of the kind of aggressive, um, chemically rich ways we've been doing things isn't working anymore. Plants and pests and insects and fungi are becoming resistant to the chemicals. You've got to come up with a new chemical that's going to work, just like the antibiotics that you have to keep replacing. And it can take $10 billion to come up with a new chemical that you can have permission to put in the ground. But if you come up with a biological, a bacteria or a bacterial product, you can get that in the ground much, much cheaper because it's already there, it's natural, it's something that regulatory agencies will let you put in the ground. And then I also work on technology to do farming without the plowing step. And so this technology is about moving things through soil to the roots that don't require plowing. So we can do that more efficiently. Um, and I think I'll, I think I'll skip some of the gory details. On, on, on uh, <coughs> some of our research products. <coughs> so, so when I agreed to come here today, um, I was hoping to be able to interact with some of you a little bit as well and not just tell you what I do. So I've shared with you a little bit about, you know, where I grew up and how I became a scientist and what I work on in the lab and a little bit about what my perspectives are. But I would love to hear a little bit more about you. Why are you in this room today, for one thing? Um, <laughs> yeah? You getting class credit? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Not surprised. <laughs> and what class is that? Environment. Environmental science? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm the <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Uh, my name is Mila. I want to major in computer science, but I also want to focus on AI and like mm -hmm. minor in environmental science. Yeah. And I want to like maybe work on AI like research in like field of sustainability mm -hmm. and I'm here to like learn more about it. Actually AI Not and like learn about AI but like right. about environmental like science. Yeah I, I think that's sorry I, th I think that's fantastic um, you know AI obviously you know you guys don't have to learn how to write anymore right because you can just use AI bots <laughs> to, to write all your papers for you now you know in my generation was coming up, we were like, why do we need to learn math? We have calculators. You guys don't have to learn how to write because you've got AI writers. But um, AI is going to be huge, and AI has a lot to say about climate because these systems I'm talking about are incredibly complicated. And the approaches we used to use, where we kind of understood everything that goes on and how it connects, are probably not going to work when it comes to going from the millimeter scale to the global scale and all of the political economic implications. And so AI has a lot to say about figuring out that really complex system. So I think that's pretty awesome. Where are you going to go to college? Duke. Here? No, Duke. Or Duke. Oh, you've already yeah. got accept uh, Duke, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that was our that was our big rival when I was at Virginia. Yeah. I'm also in this room because I'm a beekeeper and I care about the environment. Beekeeper, okay. 
How are your bees? Um, hopefully they can get through the winter. Okay. Mm -hmm. But we'll see in the spring if they're alive. Have you had those uh, those aphids, the that are attacking the bee colonies oh, around? The burrow mites. Yes, yes, uh, yes. We did test for them, and surprisingly, our hive didn't have. Um, they were like below the threshold, but we still treated for them in just in case. Um, yeah. Because that's how our hives died last year. <laughs> These are cool. Hey. Do you have bees here at the school? Yeah, we have three hives. And then we have, uh, my family, we have a few more up in Redding, Connecticut. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Bees are fascinating. The waggle dance and all that stuff. It's really cool. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure. I'm curious about like when you're talking about the microfluidics and stuff, how you actually in the lab, how you make the like environment that you're testing like in the lab more like resemble what you're actually seeing in the field. Well, so is this the gory stuff that you're talking about? This is the gory <laughs> stuff, yeah. So we use a technique uh, called photolithography. It's how integrated circuits are made in computers to make physical structures that are smaller than the width of a human hair. We pattern the structures using light. So we can actually, our spatial resolution is equal to the wavelength of the light that we're using to pattern. So about 250 nanometers. And so we make a physical geometry that's actually modeled after real soil. And then we create a chamber that actually matches the particle size distribution of a real sandy limb soil dug up from behind the dairy bar on the store's campus. And we vary the spatial arrangement of those grains so that it emulates aggregated, healthy versus non-aggregated soil. And then we chemically treat the surfaces so that they have the water repellency of real soil in a kind of a healthier state versus a non-healthy state. And then we actually load bacteria into the chambers. And so this is a photomicrograph of a whole structure. The green dots are individual bacteria. The bold black line here is air infiltrating. And what we do in this experiment is we take the soil chip, we load it with bacteria that can do a special magic trick or bacteria that can't do a certain magic trick and we uh, measure how fast water infiltrates over time and what we found in this one example is that a certain type of bacteria that makes extracellular polymer it's the same stuff that mu mucinex the drug tries to knock back when you're congested with bacteria in your nose um, is that slimy mucusy stuff actually can cause a soil structure to retain its water to be in a 20 to 80 percent wet region. It goes from being in that moist, sorry, that word, <laughs> that appropriate hydration region of seven hours and it doubles it to 14 hours, okay? Now this wouldn't happen on the bench. This doesn't happen just in a Petri dish or something like that. It only happens when you give it a microstructure that, that uh, emulates the real microstructure of a real soil. And what we've discovered here is that by the microbe producing this one particular sugar that it normally would produce, but this bacteria can make it and this one can't, it can hold moisture in that real soil structure twice as long and that's huge because now with climate change, we don't necessarily have less rain, but the rain that comes, comes in extreme rain events and then a long break between rain events, right? And so the rain return interval, how long you have to wait before it rains again, might be much longer. 
And so in this case, we have bacteria that are symbionts to the plant that live in the soil that can hold that moisture long enough that the plants will stay alive until the next rain comes versus drying out, dying, and all that carbon returning to the atmosphere. But this is the kind of result you can't find if you're studying bacteria in a big petri dish, which is not the environment that they evolved to live in. So it's just one example. This technique is done all the time with drug discovery now. So instead of just looking at a chemical in a petri dish or in a test tube and then going to the mouse, oh crap, that one didn't work. Test tube, mouse, test tube, mouse. They instead have an intermediate step which is a kind of organ on a chip system that is a little bit more like whatever bodily tissue you're trying to study. It could be a spheroid of cancer cells or it could be you know, lung tissue or heart tissue or skin tissue in a microfluidic system. And so you can study the effects of your compound of interest in that experimental system on the lab bench. It's a little bit more like the real system to more finally differentiate the ones that are working from the ones that are not working. And then when you go to your animal model, you're more likely to get to winners more quickly. So it basically speeds up the pace of research. And we're doing that in my lab for agriculture biotechnology. So we can measure, you know, apples to apples. How did this organism do in the test? How did this one do? How did this one do? How did that one do? Um, and kind of race them against each other and develop better and better and better um, basically agriculture nutraceuticals or probiotics to add to soil to make agriculture work better with less water, with less, um, with less fertilizers, with less chemicals, a little bit less of an environmental impact. Thanks for the question. I that's, promise I didn't pay her. That's, that's crazy. I don't, so. Like, so you basically replicate the soil. That's right. That's exactly right. But uh, like a computer is doing that? Well, um, we did actually use a computer. So I had a postdoc that was a computer science buff. And so she built in a computer, essentially, a, a, a distribution of spheres. And then she wrote a computer program to shake those spheres with rules so that they could not overlap the same spot. Oh my god. And they had to fit space, you know, a, a form filling spatial optimization algorithm and she basically in the computer shook it down until they all found their spot and then we basically took slices of that geometry and that's what we converted into a, a soil structure so yeah that's how that works but you can also do it by by using imaging techniques by using like a cat scan of a soil and finding the actual structure and that kind of thing so any other questions yeah, other people. Oh no, go ahead. Okay, it might like not be about your research, but you said like you're pro nuclear energy. Yeah. Do you prefer nuclear energy over like renewable energy? Oh gosh, no, no, okay. <laughs> not at all. But you might have seen on the news today there was news about fission. You know that they finally got more energy out of fission than they put into it in the first place, and you know that might be big news, but it still has a lot of we're still 20 years away at least from anything practical. And I just feel like we're less than 20 years away from bad effects from climate change and we just keep burning coal. So I think there's a place for nuclear in a portfolio of things, but we should absolutely pursue renewables to the maximum. There just isn't enough capacity for, for wind and solar to completely offset air travel and you know terrestrial transportation, ground transportation, and food production, and everything all at the same time, with our population continuing to grow the way it is. So. Anyone else? What about you guys in the back? <laughs> <laughs> Caitlin, what's the question you have? <laughs> Gray? Well, I Nothing? can ask you guys some questions. I have a question. Yeah? <laughs> what would be like your, uh, your opinion or I guess like your advice? Um, sometimes I feel like while I might be doing the right thing to combat climate change, that like the people surrounding me, like outside of my community, 
aren't doing anything for us. So I'm just a kid that was in the Northeast um, from, from Connecticut. Like, how could I, like, ensure that there are people around me, not only in this country, but uh, internationally, that want to do the same thing? Because, I mean, this country doesn't, it has a literal problem, but it's not as bad as, like, the streets of India. Mm -hmm. um, so how, like, like, how can I make a difference um, to make sure that that's not happening in other places? I mean, if you, I think if you got... If you got 10 different you know, experts up here, you probably get 10 different answers. But my personal bias is I'm a technologist. I'm an engineer. And I think that we can't go back to you know, horse-drawn carriages and that kind of a model with 8 billion people on the earth, unless you're willing to kill 80% of the people currently alive to go back to an earlier gentler time where people died at 40 and abuse was rife. Mm -hmm. So I think the only way forward is through greater, better technology. And so I would urge you to get a STEM major or work in public policy or become a politician or become a lawyer or become a green bank finance person to, to work for climate and energy in a big way. Not just your personal recycling habits or dietary choices, but dedicate your life, your career to this, whichever way your interests and talents lie. And, and truly, I am an engineer. I mean, I love dad jokes. I love Tolkien. I mean, I am a nerd from the top to the bottom, right? That's just the way it is. But I respect the social sciences. All the time, engineers come up with these great new technologies that nobody uses because they don't work socially, economically, politically, whatever, you know? And so it's gonna require political scientists. It's gonna require artists. It's gonna require people that inspire other people. It's gonna require a lot of teachers. It's gonna require, you know, all sorts of different roles in society in order to, to really move the needle. But I think that we won't have a future if everyone just does their bit in their little patch, in their little spot of you know, Fairfield County. Yeah. My personal thought. So I hope I didn't make you feel guilty. <laughs> it's also a huge growth industry. You know, the, you can look at these trends in technology, right? So we had a big, biotech spike at one point, we had a nanotech spike. Ag biotech, technologies to feed people that aren't gonna screw the climate up are gonna be enormously sought after economically. Energy solutions are gonna be enormously sought after economically. When you're paying 50 cents a kilowatt hour for electricity and $10 a gallon for gas, you're gonna have a high demand for a car that gets 200 miles to the gallon or is fully electric or a new product to put on your house or a new product for whatever your lifestyle is. And so whether you're inventing the technologies, an entrepreneur, finding the markets, advertising for them, public influencing, whatever it is you're doing, this is gonna drive the economy, these types of technologies in the future, in my view. So you may as well, you know, do well by doing good. And get in on the ground floor of some of the most important technological revolution that's gonna happen over the next 50 years. I think maybe one more, because I know it's getting almost, what is it, like almost three now? We have a 310 bus, but um, one more question, anyone? Anyone, anyone? <laughs> Kayla, do you have any questions from the list that you Oh, I mean, oh yeah, okay. There's tons um, of questions from the list. I have a question for you though. This is something I, if you don't mind, I'm, I'm curious what the people in this room think. I have this chart here that you probably can't read too well, but this is the percentage of bachelor's degrees conferred to women in the United States um, over time. And you see all these different sciences, biology, psychology, health professions, agriculture, math and science are all at or above 50%. But engineering is stuck here at a little bit under 20% over decades. And computer science actually was almost 40% at one point, and it's been falling ever since. And so I am curious 
why it is that that women in your generation are not interested in engineering or computer careers? What does the computer scientist think? I can take a guess. Okay. I've seen a lot of like people who are like women, spe yeah. specifically who are engineering or like computer science. They're like want to apply for a job. Um, they say that they like might not get an interview back because like simply because in the resume their like name is a woman. Mm. And I've heard like a lot of that like especially in like computer science and like software engineering that like it's harder for women to find a job. And I mean I'm not like. <laughs> Totally sure that that's how like people think that are like oh no it's going to be harder for me because I'm a woman or like it's a male dominated field maybe that's why I don't want to go to it. Mm -hmm. I think that's why like some women might be like hesitant to do that. Mm -hmm. Have are there any ladies in the room that are thinking about going engineering or computer science other than the two here down in front? Are some of you thinking about sciences in general, pre med, pre vet, marine biology? A few of you, yeah. Does anyone have a mom or an aunt or a sister who's an engineer? Yeah. Sort of? <laughs> sort of. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, give it some thought. Um, you know, on your list of questions, and one of the other things I work on is, is um, women and minorities in engineering. And um, the, the answer we came up with is that there's not a lot of family support for girls to go into engineering because you hear a lot of negative stories about, oh, it's going to be hard, they're not going to hire you. Oh, college is hard enough, why don't you just major in biology because engineering will be too hard. And so girls get that message and guys often do not from their families, their parents, counselors, even their teachers on occasion. So it's a perception thing. And uh, if anyone has any questions about Environmental engineering versus environmental science versus environmental studies, I'd be more than happy to address that issue as well. Um, and anything else you got? Um, my, I have some cards up here. I can leave them with your president and your teacher. And my email address is pretty easy to remember. My last name is Shore without an E. If you Google me, I will come up. I'm super easy to find. So, and I'd be more than happy um, if anyone has any questions to answer them at some other time as well. Did they get out of class credit yeah. by now? Good. <laughs> well, they got, they got a couple extra credit points. Whew. Yeah. But Sweet. I thought it was important for them to be here because I think in my class, I say all the time that everything can be brought back to environmental science. Everything. You name something, we can play a game and get back to it again. You know, and at this point in our lives, climate change is going to touch every single thing, and it already has. And so to hear it from someone else, maybe. <laughs> Amen. Maybe it'll stay. I swear I'm not the only one saying it. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's definitely. And I, even to my students who maybe aren't so interested in environmental science that, you know, getting in, you know, if uh, you're a finance person and that's what you want, I always say, like, the next green technology is really where the money is, and get in now because, you know, mm -hmm. it's, that's, that's where the world's heading. And so, um, 100%. you know, even if you're not interested, it, it affects you. So I think it's really important for them to come here and see someone else too. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good luck to all of you. Yes. All right, you guys are dismissed. <laughs> Stop looking like you're. Uh, so it made you pick Duke of all terrible, terrible places. <laughs> <laughs>